Hi, I'm Yvonne Galanin. Welcome. I spent 20 years working in pharma and biotech. And then about six years ago, the universe directed my attention to skincare. I know it sounds crazy, but I had a long standing skin condition. By accident, I cured it. Well, I didn't cure it. I got, again, a gift from the universe that, that cured it. And it directed my attention to the role of the dermal fat cells. And so here we are six years later, and I've acquired a burgeoning knowledge of skincare, really from an outsider's perspective. And I want to share it with you because I think it could be helpful because I've learned from scratch and I think you can too. And what I'd like to share today is the evaluation framework that I use when I wanna understand something new. It derives from the 20 years of experience in pharma and biotech, and it's really not that complicated as you'll see. All right, thank you, now we can start. So I hope I haven't lost all of you at the mention of a framework. I know it's not typically when you get from a YouTuber. Most YouTube videos focus on a hot topic, something sensational. Botox in a bottle, the five face scrubs that will ruin your face. You know, it's highly focused. It's intended to get your attention. And these are fun videos, they're entertaining, it's fun, but it's hard to learn from them because you get a little piece of knowledge, maybe a very little piece, and it's hard to put that in perspective. So what a framework does, it's like the outline of a puzzle. It allows you to put the pieces of knowledge together and build something whole and lasting. The other thing about a framework is it allows you to be consistent. So if you use the same framework to evaluate product A and product B, you know you're not cheating. You know you're not falling for your bias. You're comparing A and B by the same standard. And that's helpful. And the other reason a framework is useful is because Sometimes very little things will make a huge difference, whether something is useful to you, useful product, a useful modality, or unuseful to you. I'm not saying good or bad, I'm saying useful and unuseful. Sometimes very little things. And when you use a framework, it forces you to be comprehensive, not just focus on the big positive or be scared of the big negative, to really look at the complete picture. So the first step, we're gonna get a little wonky. I'm gonna teach you some science jargon. Intervention, what's an intervention? Well, scientists, and you're a scientist too, scientists evaluate interventions. It's really just a thing. What kind of thing? Any intentional addition to a practice, anything that you do or one does with the purpose of having some type of effect is an intervention. Pretty easy, right? Now you've got some science jargon under your belt. So typically we think of an intervention as an injection or a procedure or a cosmetic. It's, you know, it's something that we're using that's going to make a change. But I want you to think about interventions more broadly. So massage 
is an intervention. Diet is an intervention. Exercise is an intervention. Face taping is an intervention. Face yoga is an intervention. Anything you are doing, anything that you're doing with an intent to create a change is an intervention. And we're going to, together, we're going to evaluate all these things. But now you've got your first bit of science jargon under your belt. Let's go forward. Okay, so now we're finally going to get to it. What's the framework? I know it took a long time to get to this point, but here we are. So the framework has four parts, four parts. Part one, what does the intervention do? What does it do? Part two, how does the intervention do it? How does it work? What's the mechanism? Part three, what's the data? What's the efficacy data? What's the safety data? And part four, what's the source of the data. Can we trust it? Now, you're probably asking yourself, maybe not, but most evaluations focus, at least on YouTube, focus on three, the safety and efficacy data. And generally, it's one sensational piece of, of data, either positive or negative. But I think you can sense that that's really not the way to go. So as a scientist, and remember, you and I are scientists together. Here, we're scientists together. We know that that's not the way to go. And as I was thinking about it, as I was thinking, how do I really uh, get this across? An analogy came to me, and it's to think of an evaluation as a criminal trial. I know that seems maybe a little far-fetched, but hear me out. So in a criminal trial, the first important piece are the charges. What is the defendant charged with? The charges are critical for framing the evidence. Without charges, it's hard to focus on what the evidence says. So. That explains element one. Element two, the how, is like a motive for a defendant. Is there a reason to believe that the defendant, or in this case, the intervention, could do what it's charged with? You know, in a criminal trial, Motive is very important. If you don't have a motive, all the other elements have to be really strong. And similarly, with an intervention, if you don't have a how, if you don't have a credible how, if you don't have a mechanism of action, then all the other evidence for the intervention has to be really, really strong. All right, and then there's element four. What's the source of the data? Well, that's like in a criminal trial, when you have witnesses, are the witnesses reliable? Can we believe them? Are they good witnesses? Or in the case of evidence, what's the provenance of the evidence? Is it good evidence? Can we trust it? So that's it. That's the evaluation framework. What does the intervention do? How does it do it? What's the data? And is the data trustworthy? Does it come from a good source? All right, you've got the framework. Now we're gonna dig in a little bit to the individual elements. Element one, exciting, what does an intervention do? This may seem really simple. Come on, like how hard can that be? Well, 
in the field of aesthetics, it's really hard sometimes. And why is that? Because aesthetics is essentially unregulated. FDA and the EMA regulate drugs. They regulate devices a little bit, not so much for efficacy, but for safety. So all they care is that device is safe and really just safe for a short period of time. And those are really the two, only two types of interventions that are regulated. And so why does this matter? because the FDA and the EMA won't allow other types of interventions, whether it's nutritional supplements or cosmetics or at-home devices to make any claims. Can't make claims. You can't, as a cosmetic, say that you change the structure and function of the skin. But of course you do. Of course you do. Anything that you do to your skin will change its structure and function on a cellular level, as they say. It works on a cellular level. Of course, everything works on a cellular level, and everything you do to your skin will change it structurally. But the FDA and the EMA create this pretend area where all the other interventions that are not regulated can't actually say what they do. And so that makes it hard sometimes to understand what are the charges? What is this intervention supposed to do? I know, it's crazy. So let's take one example of this. And it's one that annoys me a lot because I see this advertised on Instagram all the time. Here's sort of an approximation of what the company says. Because I don't want to pick on the company because everyone does this. They just do it in a way that annoys me. All topical blah, blah, blah are formulated. Blah, blah, blah is the company's product. All topical blah, blah, blahs are formulated with the first ingredient scientifically proven to reverse skin's biological age at the cellular level. So the first ingredient scientifically proven to reverse the skin's biological age at the cellular level or molecular level, it doesn't matter. These two things are interchangeable and interchangeably meaningless. I know it sounds great. Who wouldn't want their skin biological change to be reversed? But let's get into it. Let's try to understand. What does this really mean? Fortunately, with this company, they provide a reference to make it seem scientific. And you can follow the reference and you can read this company's publications and patent applications. And you'll see that what they mean by reversing the skin's biological age is they're saying that the intervention, this topical cream, changes the methylation pattern in the DNA taken from the skin. Okay, so we've got some scientific jargon we need to work through here. Methylation. Methylation is like coloring of the DNA. It's like if you think of the DNA as black and white, methylation is color. It affects how the DNA is transcribed, whether it's transcribed a lot or a little, it changes how the DNA is used. So it's coloring of the DNA. And so you have in the skin as it ages, in some places, the DNA of skin becomes over methylated. There's more coloring than in younger skin. And in some areas, the DNA becomes less methylated, so you have less color. So the pattern of coloring on the DNA, methylation, you see how we've just worked through that jargon and now you get it, I hope. So that's what the company is, is saying 
that their their topical cream does, their topical intervention does. And in fact, they're pretty specific. I guess it makes it sound more believable if they're concrete and specific. They say that their product reverses or changes the methylation, moves it back in time by 2.6 years. Whoa, 2.6 years. Who wouldn't want that? But here's the problem. We have no idea what moving back the methylation pattern by 2.6 years does to the skin. There's no data on the relationship between that change and what wrinkles, laxity, pigmentation, inflammation, right? There's no data for that. So we're just left with this idea that's seemingly positive, that you're getting a freebie, a 2.6 year reduction in the methylation pattern of the skin. And, but that you can imagine how difficult it makes to do the evaluation. So it's hard to go from that to even establishing a motive. And then what, what evidence do we evaluate? What evidence is related to that motive that's related to that mechanism of action? We don't know. And so you see, hopefully from this example, that it's important, very important to get the charges right. Because the charges set the pattern for the evaluation. How does the intervention work? The first question to think about when understanding how an intervention works is to think about what cell types the intervention is affecting. And an intervention can affect more than one cell type. Sometimes you hear companies say, our wonderful product works at a cellular level. They all work at a cellular level. Everything works at a cellular level. All interventions affect cells. So there are several cell types, major cell types in the skin. So you have keratinocytes in the epidermis and several subtypes of keratinocytes. You have melanocytes, the cells responsible making pigment, melanin. You have fibroblasts. These are the cells that make collagen, elastin. Fibroblasts are located in the dermis. And you have immune cells, several types of immune cells. You have Langerhan cells, mast cells, macrophages. The immune system is actively working in the skin, just like the immune system is working in all the other organs of the body. And you have my specialty, dermal fat cells. Now, most people don't recognize that the skin has its own unique fat cells, and we'll be doing lots of videos about dermal fat cells. So that's the types of cells that an intervention can affect. So once we know the cell type, it also tells us, okay, where in the skin does the intervention have to get to in order to be effective? So once you know the cell type or types, then you start thinking about the signaling pathways. Now, a signaling pathway is another bit of scientific jargon. Signaling pathway is really just that simple. It's a set of signals that are relayed from outside the the cell, to inside the cell, to different compartments of the cell, and then back outside the cell, a series of signaling steps that occurs when an intervention affects a skin cell. Think of a signaling pathway as a collection of dominoes. 
and there's a lead domino, which is what the intervention directly affects. And then that domino knocks over another domino, which knocks over another domino, which may knock over a dozen other dominoes. And then the end domino falls. The end domino falls and there's a physical change. Energy has been exchanged. Energy has been converted. A physical change has occurred, changes the skin. So let's take one example of this signaling pathway, which is particularly interesting to me, which involves immature dermal fat cells. Now, immature dermal fat cells are called preadipocytes. And they can receive a signal, or actually they receive multiple signals. And when the signals are right, these cells convert to mature adipocytes. So they change from a flat type of cell to a rounded cell. And that can be triggered by different interventions hitting different dominoes in the pathway. So as we see in this chart, one of these dominoes is something called PPAR, P-P-A-R, gamma, the Greek uh, G, PPAR gamma ligands. And a ligand is just something that connects uh, with a receptor on a cell to have an effect. So think of a PPAR gamma ligand as something touching the PPAR gamma domino and having it fall over and trigger other dominoes, other steps in that signaling pathway. But let's think, well, what are, what are these mysterious PPAR gamma ligands? Well, these ligands are found in everyday cosmetic products. Anything that has a oil, like a safflower seed oil, or sunflower seed oil, these oils contain something called long-chain fatty acids. It's a type of fatty acid that has a long carbon chain. And these particular long-chain fatty acids can hit that PPAR gamma domino and cause it to fall over. And so, for example, if you heard of an intervention that claimed that it can help increase plumpness and that it was acting through the fat cells, through the immature fat cells, by causing them to convert to mature fat cells and go from this shape to this shape, you can imagine how that would add plumpness to the skin. Well, if that intervention contained a safflower seed oil or a sunflower seed oil, in sufficient amount, then you'd say, okay, that's a motive. I could see how that intervention could potentially work. So now we get into element three of the evaluation framework which is safety and efficacy data. Safety data, right? What's safety data? Well, mostly in aesthetics, we just want something that works. It does something. So we skip the safety data. Safety data is really important. First, do no harm. We're gonna get into a lot of modalities where safety is going to be the troublesome part. So the first bit of efficacy data that I look at is something called an EC50. Now let's explain this jargon. EC50 is the effective concentration for 50% binding. Whoa, what's that? 
So remember, in our previous example, we had a first domino called the PPAR gamma receptor. And we had ligands found in oils, ligands called oleic acid and linoleic acid that bind. So this is the PPAR gamma receptor, and these are the ligands, oleic acid and linoleic acid, and they bind this receptor. And the question is, how much oleic acid and linoleic acid do we need in a cell for the receptor to be bound 50% of the time? The idea is that 50% of the time, if you bind 50% of the receptors, that many of them will be knocked over, right? So that's the EC50. You know, you're getting one piece of scientific jargon under your belt at a time, and it feels good. It feels good to know these things. So the EC50 gives us a read on how powerful an ingredient is. And let's take the example of oleic acid or linoleic acid. They're pretty much equally powerful. How much of those ligands do we need to occupy 50% of the PPAR gamma receptor? It turns out that several labs have done this experiment and the concentration is in the micromolar range. Okay, that's another piece of jargon, micromolar range. What does that mean? So concentration, as it's used by scientists, and you and I, our scientists here, citizen scientists. And concentration is how much per unit of volume. And typically it's measured in moles. Mole is just like dozen. It's an artificial measure of how much. Dozen measures 12. Could measure 48, but we said it measures 12. And similarly, mole measures a certain amount, and that's what it is. So micromolar means parts per million. One part per million, 10 parts per million, 20 parts per million, but not 1,000 parts per million, less than 1,000 parts per million. So that's the micromolar range. So for example, in a cell, if you had 30 parts or moles of oleic acid per million, that would be enough to bind 50% of the PPAR gamma receptor. And that sounds really powerful, but drugs, drugs are much more powerful. So drugs typically need to work in the nanomolar range, which is one part per trillion, and potent drugs work in the picomolar range, which is a thousand times more potent. All right, so that's our first bit of efficacy data. And now we're gonna discuss in vitro data. The EC50 falls into a larger class of data called in vitro data. In vitro from the Latin to be in glass, so outside of the of the body and typically we say petri dish we use petri dish for in vitro and we can have in vitro efficacy data and in vitro safety data now we just talked about binding efficacy how much of a substance you need to bind that first domino the PPAR gamma receptor and that may be different from the concentration necessary to knock down that last domino, cause a physical change. Now, in the case of oleic acid and linoleic acid, an in vitro experiment would take immature fat cells, preadipocytes, provide a concentration of oleic and linoleic acid, and see what concentration of those ingredients is necessary to increase the rate of conversion 
from an immature state, which the cells look like this, to a mature state where the cells look like this. And so now we're measuring the effect of concentration to attain a physical change, or to get that last domino to fall. And with oleic acid and linoleic acid, the effect of concentration to get the last domino to fall is similar to the concentration to bind the receptor. So it's consistent. And we can also use concentration levels to measure safety. And typically, the most obvious safety endpoint on a cellular level is do the cells die? So do the cells die? How much of a concentration do you need for cells to start dying? Typically, that's an experiment that scientists will do, is they'll look at the effective concentration and they'll see, okay, are cells dying at that concentration? Okay, what if I increase that concentration by 10? The cells start dying then? Okay, no. Okay, what about 100? And so on. And that gives us the window between efficacy and safety on a cellular level with that particular cell. This section is about the importance of getting there, getting there. So in an in vitro system, the intervention is brought to the cells by the lab technician. The lab technician applies the intervention to the cells in the Petri dish. So the cells are literally swimming in the case of an ingredient in the intervention. The intervention doesn't have to jump through any hoops. It gets there. We know it gets there. There's no question. In the real world of the skin, the intervention has to get to the target cells. So these could be the keratinocytes and melanocytes in the epidermis. They could be very challengingly fibroblasts in the dermis, or in the example that we've been using, they could be fat cells in the dermal white adipose tissue, which actually begins in the lower third of the dermis. So the challenge in the real world is getting to the target cells. So this is obvious. If the intervention can't get to the target cell, if it can't knock over that first domino, it's not going to work. That's pretty straightforward. Now, fortunately, there's a way that we can evaluate whether interventions can get there. So in the case of topical ingredients, ingredients that sit on top of the skin and penetrate the skin, we have laboratory experiments that we can do to see if they're getting there. And we can use in these experiments explanted skin from donors or animal skin. So we're using real skin. So one example of this type of experiment is using the Franz chamber. Now this has been accepted as the gold standard for assessing getting there or penetration. In fact, the European Medicines Agency even has a guidance, guidelines that manufacturers can follow using the Franz Chamber setup to assess whether their ingredients get to the part of the skin that they're supposed to be. Now we're gonna do an entire episode on the Franz Chamber. I love it. We're gonna talk about exactly how the experiments are done, in great detail, but for now, we just know that there's a way to assess whether an intervention can get there.
in vivo studies, in vivo from the Latin, in the body. So in vivo studies are very important because they tell us what's happening in the skin. And we can dig in in an in vivo study, take biopsies, look at the mechanism, look what's happening in the skin. Now, traditionally, in other disciplines, in vivo studies means animal studies. So the two types of animals that are used in skin in vivo studies are either a rodent or a pig. Now, rodents, mice, or rats are great to use because they're small, they're inexpensive, and we can use larger numbers and get a more meaningful quantitative result. However, two issues. One is the skin of rodents is actually quite different from human skin. For example, with their dermal white adipose tissue, the rodents actually have a barrier, a physical barrier between the dermal white adipose tissue and the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So it's not a perfect model of human skin. So what's the other problem? Well, obviously animal welfare. And that's you know a reason why many manufacturers don't do traditional in vivo studies. So the pig, let's just talk about the pig. The pig skin is a great model of human skin. Pigs are very expensive and obviously for animal welfare reasons, you wouldn't want to do a pig experiment unless you were really testing a important scientific question that merited the sacrifice of animals. Fortunately, we have other in vivo systems that we can use that are not animal studies. So the best is explanted skin. So if someone's going from an operation, they donate their skin, and that fresh skin can be used for experiments. Now it's important that that skin not be damaged and is as complete and as functional as possible. So the really good academic research labs will actually test the quality of the explanted skin that they're using to show that it's a good model of real skin. So one step down from explanted skin are artificial skin systems where the researchers have seeded, planted, grown different types of cells in laboratory conditions. And this is supposed to mimic the human skin. And these setups can be useful in some circumstances and not useful for others. For example, there's no artificial skin system, as far as I know, that includes the dermal white adipose tissue. So that's what we have for in vivo systems, animals, skin explants, artificial skin. And this is important because these experiments tell us what's going on in real skin. So now we're finally going to talk about clinical studies. You're probably wondering, when is this guy ever going to get to clinical studies? And I understand your impatience because typically clinical study is the only evidence that a manufacturer puts forth on behalf of their intervention. Here's the clinical study clinically proven to do X and Y. So think about it. A clinical study is the most complex experiment that can be done in support of an intervention. There are human beings involved. 
both conducting the study and participating in the study and evaluating the results. So you can imagine that in such a complicated experiment, quality matters a lot. And we're going to talk about some characteristics that ensure quality is better than not. And so here are the characteristics of a good study, a gold standard study. So protocol registered, placebo or active controlled, blinded, randomized, and published in a peer-reviewed journal. So let's start with protocol register. What does that mean? So to be published in a good scientific journal, your study has to have the protocol registered with an organization like clinicaltrials.gov. So a registry like clinicaltrials.gov will ask the sponsor a lot of questions. The sponsor has to lay everything out up front. What's the primary endpoint? What are you going to show? What are the charges that you're going to prove? What's the secondary endpoint? The secondary charges. How are you going to do the study? How many subjects are you going to include? How are you going to measure? How are you going to do the statistics? Everything is laid out ahead of time so that you can see whether the study succeeded or failed. That's the scientific method. So that's protocol registered, and that's really important. So placebo or active controlled. So there's the intervention group. That's the group of subjects that's getting the intervention. Whether it's a topical cream or a machine procedure, they're getting that intervention. And then there's the other group, which is similar and baseline characteristics to the intervention group, and it serves as a control. And the control group can be treated with a placebo, an inert substance or procedure, or an active. So in the case of the Retin-A clinical studies, the control group received sunscreen and moisturizer. So that was considered usual care. So placebo or active control, randomized. So randomized means that the setup of the two groups, the placebo group and the intervention group was done in an unbiased fashion. No one selected, okay, this subject goes into that group, this subject goes into the other group. It was done by a random fashion using a randomizer. And why is that important? Because you can cheat by putting all the good subjects in the intervention group and all the bad subjects in the control group or vice versa, depending on what you wanted to do. So randomized is important. Blinded. So a study can be single blinded, meaning that either the participants in the study or the evaluators didn't know who was getting what treatment, or it could be double-blinded, meaning that neither the participants nor the evaluators knew who was getting what treatment. And that's really important because if you know who's getting what, you can cheat when you're doing the evaluation, or you can cheat as a participant. If you know you're getting a placebo, maybe you don't use it at all, right? So that's important blinded, published in a peer-reviewed journal. In a peer-reviewed journal, typically, you're going to have to lay everything out. Your protocol, changes to the protocol, who dropped out of the study. It's sort of a test on the validity of a study. Now, you may or may not be surprised, but most studies in skincare are not good studies. They don't fit any of these qualities or characteristics. Most studies, in fact, don't even have their protocols registered with an organization 
like clinicaltrials.gov. And why is that? Because by registering the protocol, you're setting the bar. You're saying, this is what I'm going to do. And, and you can judge whether I've done it or not. It's much better for marketing purposes not to set the bar, not to set the primary endpoint, not to set the secondary endpoint. But just look at everything. Look at 100 endpoints. If you get one that succeeds, well, you cherry pick that one successful endpoint and you say, look, clinically proven to do X. Now, the fact that all the other endpoints were negative, you don't have to mention it because you're not going to publish in a peer review journal, right? And that's how most studies are done, unfortunately. Now, one more thing. Clinical studies and in vivo studies should produce efficacy data, but they should also produce safety data, right? I, had, I didn't even mention safety data with respect to the in vivo studies. So shame on me. But yes, clinical studies also measure safety data. But there's an important asterisk here. Most clinical studies are relatively short, one month, three months, six months, and then the study ends. Now, what you want to see is a longer term follow up, two years, five years, 10 years, a longer follow up to show, okay, the intervention worked, it did X, were there any side effects that weren't apparent at two months or three months? Sourcing and data quality. Now, this is actually going to be, I think, the most interesting segment, or at least the most salacious one. And why is that? Why do we care about sources at all? Think about the sources as the witnesses in a criminal trial. Now, you want to know, do the sources, do these witnesses have something to gain from providing the evidence that they provide? Or are they objective? So in the real world, there are very few unbiased objective studies that are done. You know, mostly people do studies on skincare because they're paid. And so they have some bias towards the people who are paying them. And that's just the real world. That's okay. But it's important to understand, did the people conducting the study have something to gain? And when a study is published in a peer reviewed journal, the people conducting the study have to state whether they were biased in any way or perceived bias. Were they paid to do the study? Were they paid as a consultant? So we know most studies, as we've discussed in skincare, aren't published in a peer review journal. They're done by private clinical study organizations that want to keep the manufacturer happy. So those studies you have to really take with a grain of salt because the people doing the study, their reputation is not on the line. In most cases, the manufacturer won't even say who did the study. The study won't be evaluated by an independent group. So there's lots of room for these private organizations to sort of bend things in the right direction, in the direction of the sponsor. Now, occasionally we will get lucky and a clinical study will actually be done by an independent objective group. And this typically happens when there's an important scientific question. So for example, in the case of protein supplementation and skincare, we have several studies from independent academic groups that had no financial interest in the outcome. They just wanted to understand how does eating protein affect skin quality? Now, typically, the best that you can get is not a full clinical study, but maybe an in vitro or an in vivo study conducted by an academic group that values its reputation. 
Now this academic group cares about its reputation and they don't wanna waste time doing stupid stuff. So they'll look at real scientific questions and they'll do it in a sincere scientific way. So if I see a academic group that's published a in vitro study or an in vivo study, and maybe they were sponsored by a manufacturer, I still look at that study as being meaningful and objective, especially if the experiments were done properly. So one way you can control bias, even if it's there, is the quality of the evidence that's collected. And what do I mean by quality? I mean objective. So evidence that you can't fake, you can't bend, it's hard to bend, and that's hard objective evidence. So let's take an example. You can take an ultrasound measurement of the skin and that ultrasound, if done consistently, is not going to lie. It's going to show you the layout of the skin and you can measure the changes in the skin objectively. And so it's very difficult to cheat with data like that. It's the same thing when you're measuring skin elasticity. You can use an objective measure of skin elasticity, a probe that you put on the skin that pulls the skin back and measures how quickly it bounces back. And as long as you're doing those measurements in a blinded fashion, that will produce objective data that you can believe. So that's the evaluation framework. That's it. I hope you found it useful. I can't wait to apply it to topics in skincare together. And if you want to leave a comment and suggest, what should we evaluate first? What should we evaluate first? That would be really helpful. This is a humble first step. It's the first educator video in over a year. And the video quality varied a lot. Um, I actually filmed this over about 10 days. Some of it was filmed in London, some in New York, and there's noise and my hair looks weird in some and I look tired in others, uh, but it's a humble first step. And I hope you can see the intent, that the intent is to learn together. That's it. That's the sole intent here is to learn together and by doing that, we can change skincare. Thank you very much. Thank you.